Welcome to the Wood Turning Workshop. Today we're going to show you how to make your platters pretty. And we're going to do that with our guest, Trent Bosch. The Wood Turning Workshop is made possible in part by Woodcraft, since 1928, providing traditional and modern woodworking tools and supplies to generations of craftsmen. Woodcraft, helping you make wood work. Easy Wood Tools, offering a full line of wood turning tools with replaceable carbide cutters. Well, we're here with our friend Trent Bosch. Hey, thank you for being on the show. You're welcome. Uh, Trent has been turning, well, over 20 years, right? Yep, pretty much. And been making a living at it for quite a while, too. Yep, yep. And you're still a young fella. I am. <laughs> <laughs> what got you into turning? Um, you know, a long time ago, I... Uh, I got a, a lathe from a, a friend of mine yeah. and uh, you know I, I stuck it in my shop and I, I threw a piece of wood on it and started making something and I was infected with wood turning and it was just a really exciting thing for me and I you know I never looked back and I, I just started doing it. Well you've always had kind of an artistic vent too. Well, right? well you, my, my degree degrees. is in art yeah. and uh, you know so I, I saw the potential in the wood turning and the wood art type thing and it was what interests me so that's where I went with it. And, and yeah, so yeah. Where now, I we, am now we actually snagged him in the middle of clinics here in Oklahoma because you're from Colorado. Yep, yep. Uh, and so you can't bring a lot of stuff with you, but you have on your electronic device some photos of your work, right? I do. Okay. I can show you a few pictures. Okay. This is the, some of the work that I started out with. My vessels of illusion were, were some of my early work. And you and I still make that. those. Yeah. This mm -hmm. is your yep. design. It yep. looks like a vessel inside of a vessel. It right? does. Yep. 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 That is so, so cool. So there's that kind of stuff, and then I, I continued to evolve and uh, create pieces that were um, more sculptural mm -hmm. and uh, went more beyond uh, the, the traditional bowl or or hollow form stuff, and and got kind of crazy with some stuff. And I've never uh, really, um, you know found myself limited by the lathe. I right. think the lathe has a, a ton of potential and I do a lot of carving after the pieces come off the lathe as well. It looks like so, it and you're actually um, kind of mixing the look a little bit in that it looks like a smooth bowl inside of a really rough weathered bowl. Yep. So yep. you're playing with textures a lot. Yeah, yeah textures. And are. did I see that you're actually casting in bronze too? Mm -hmm. I, yep. Wow. I've, I've started casting some pieces in bronze which is a lot of fun as well. So That way you turn potential. something once and you sell it, it's gone, but you turn something once and you put it in bronze, you have I can make forever. multiples of it. Yep. That's a good yep. Idea. Exactly. You're a smart business yep. man. Yeah, well, you got to be. <laughs> <laughs> There's no starving artist here, so yeah. that's good. Oh man, three uh, axes. Yep. Axis. Yep. Multiple different What's different axes. Axes. Yep. yep. Okay. Multi-axis, <laughs> which means that it's on different axes on Holy the lathe. Cow. So mm, that works wow. out good too. There's a lot of other different things in here too, mm -hmm. but uh, you know that kind of gives you the flavor of the kind of stuff that I do in my own work. That is neat. And then behind us, we have some examples of the newer stuff you've been doing, right? Yep. Yep. Okay, and yeah. what have you been doing? These are um, pieces that I've been using to, uh, I've turned some hollow forms, uh -huh. and I've been doing some sandblasting on those, and some coloring, and some carving as well, and just kind of having fun with surfaces wow. on, on the pieces. So, so the wood has a lot of potential as far as the surface is concerned. You know, it's a, a porous material, and it can also be made to be a, a nice shiny material. So uh, I like to play upon the shininess and the, the porousness of the material and kind of see what comes of it. That's really cool. Now today you're going to help us out, especially our beginning turners and such, or even people like me. Uh, you're going to help us make our plain platters pretty, right? Yep, yep, we can do a lot of fun stuff with just very simple carving techniques. We can uh, really have a lot of fun and, and make a platter that's, you know, more than just a regular platter and, and people will look at it and go, wow. So what are we working with today? Uh, we got a piece of poplar here, which uh, will make a really nice, simple, plain platter for us. That yeah. um, We're going to do some decorative things to it, so plain wood is exactly what I like yeah. for this kind of stuff. Um, and this is a great practice material, too. So uh, if you're ending up uh, not knowing what you're going to do, a mm -hmm. piece of wood like this that didn't cost you a whole bunch of money is a really, really good thing. So, exactly. uh, so that's what we're going to start out with today. And I'm just I like gonna cheap. <laughs> mount the spur center in there by a couple of pounds with a little mallet. Okay. And I'm going to bring that up and I'm just going to stick it in the headstock here. And then I'm going to bring the tail stock up, close but not all the way in there, mm -hmm. lock it down, and then uh, feed the the live center right in there. So you're siding right down that, making a straight I line? Am, I am. I'm looking right at this this plane right here, trying to visualize a 90 degree angle between this plane and the face of the bed or the headstock. 
There is a little crack in here, which yeah. on a piece like this where we're just going to be showing people what's going on, I'm not too worried about. On a piece that I was going to spend a lot of time on in my own shop, yeah. something like that would be something I'd probably turn into maybe a piece of firewood. Yeah. Okay. So uh, that's the plan there. And I'm spinning it. It's a little bit out of round, but not too bad. Uh, position my tool rest so that my tool's just a little bit above center. And the tool rest isn't above center, it's the tool that's, that's above center. Gotcha. So uh, when I set the tool on there, um, it's going to be cutting just a hair above the center. The tool that I'm going to start out with here is a swept back grind bowl gouge, and it's a real versatile tool. I think about 90% of the time while I'm on the lathe, yeah. I'm using a tool like this. So it's, uh, it's that versatile. I can take really heavy cuts with it, I can take very fine cuts with it, and uh, you know, it's just a, a versatile tool. Someone said you had to come someplace and only bring one tool. This yeah. would be my one tool. <laughs> so the other first thing I'm going to do is I have my safety glasses. I'm going to make sure I have those on. And then I'm also going to turn the lathe down to a relatively low speed. So when I turn the lathe on, it just is running very slow. Gotcha. Uh, I don't know anything about this piece of wood. It's a brand new piece of wood. And when I put it on the lathe like this, um, I want to slowly bring that speed up to where I'm comfortable with that speed. So uh, if I tur had tur not turned it down and turned the lathe on, and the lathe went up to 3,000 RPM, we got a problem. Yeah, and so a frisbee possibly. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So definitely something to pay attention to and to be a little bit careful about. So not, that, not that we've ever done that. <laughs> Hopefully not. <laughs> Anyways, we're going to bring that up to where I have a comfortable speed. And uh, you know, I'm just going to start to true it up a little bit here. And you're pushing in because that's side drain right now, right? Yep. yep. And I'm really doing a scraping cut with this particular tool. Even though it is a gouge, and it has the ability to, uh, you know, take some nice shearing cuts, I'm just trying to true that surface up, and that's what I've done there. Okay. Now I'll probably come here and, and take a cut across the, the side of this piece. I'll start it there. I'm going to stop the lathe though before I move this tool rest. I'm going to move it just right around the corner here. So I have a little better support for that tool as I come across the top here. Okay. And uh, then we'll get that trued up and we'll, then we'll start putting some shape on it. If I start pushing too hard and I hear some vibration, I'm just going to back off a little bit. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't want to push too hard into the wood. Okay, Trent, now you've been turning a little bit off camera, but what are you working on right now? Yeah, I'm just trying to get the bottom shape of this piece uh -huh. sort of figured out before I take it and, and flip it around and put it in the chuck. Okay, so, so this is the bottom of the platter. This is going to be the bottom of the platter. That's where I'm starting with. And okay. I'm, I'm able to get this side, better access to this side while it's on the tailstock side. Right. So I'm going to take care of all the stuff I need to do okay. while it's like this. And you're still using your trusty bowl gal? Yep, same, same tool. Going to use some different techniques with it. This is more of a shear scraping cut with it which allows me to uh, refine that cut a little bit. Yeah, you can see all these lines going away as you're doing that, and that's getting very smooth. We don't like to sand, so... Uh... <laughs> no, we don't. <laughs> now, as this gets thinner and thinner, do you have to be del more de delicate with your touch, or...? Uh... Yeah. So the thinner it gets, the lighter cut you might have to take, because the flex, the wood is going to flex a little bit, and... Uh... Okay. And that would also be something you'd have to sand out as sort of a, a, a chatter or a vibration. So we're just about done with that there. I think I'm going to probably call that good for okay. this. And then I'm going to come back here. There's a tenon that we're creating on here for the uh, chuck to grab onto. Gotcha. And we're going to be using a chuck to hold this on the lathe when we flip it around. And again, I'm just kind of getting a nice sharp corner there. Different chucks require a different shape tenon. Mm -hmm. The one I'm going to use is just a square shape here. So we're uh, now. Is this a little special okay. grind I'm looking at? Yeah, this is a little bit of a, a detail tool, and it's okay. a spindle gouge, but it's it's ground with a very sharp little point out there, so I can get in tight locations where I. Uh, normally wouldn't be able to get right. with this larger tool. So you took off this bevel or the the bottom of the bevel right there, you took it off on that tool. So Quite a bit, exactly. So you're only riding just a very small part of the tool yep. on there. And this is a spindle gouge versus a bowl gouge too. Spindle gouge has a shallower flute mm -hmm. versus the bowl gouge. So okay. those are the differences between that tool. I think we're going to take this piece and, and probably flip it around and okay. put it in the chuck. Sounds good.
Well, Trent's, well, while Trent is doing that, it's now time for your turn. I get asked this a lot by new turners. What wood should I start turning? And they're afraid of the wood. And I understand that completely because when you come into a store like this and you see this great exotic wood and you want to buy it and take it home, it costs a lot. You're afraid to learn on this. I have wood that stayed in my shop for years because I didn't want to mess it up. Well, welcome to the wood you should not fear, and that's kiln dried wood. When you buy wood in a board form, it's a lot less expensive than buying a wood blank. It's also already dried, so you don't have any problems with warping or cracking. I particularly like to use maple and cherry. They're very good woods to use, and they're not that expensive. Now, another really good wood you, you can use is popul poplar. <laughs> uh, poplar is probably the least expensive wood you can buy. Now, one thing to keep in mind when you're shopping for this, get what they call is eight quarter because it's two inches thick, and that way you can do some spindle projects and some shallow bowls and platters out of it. So now you know which wood you should practice on. Yep, that looks better. Just needed to sharpen that tool up a little bit because, yeah. you know, it doesn't cut as well when it gets dull, so. Uh, yeah, I know, and it's so funny. So many people keep turning when it's dull and they wonder why their technique isn't working, that's right? That's true, that's and true. Trying to well, cut with a butter knife. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> what I've done is I've flipped this piece around and put it in the chuck now, so we're gonna be working on the, the uh, front side of it. Okay. And uh, creating the opening and the bowl and the, the little flat area where we're gonna do the carving on there. So let's okay. go ahead and get back with this. To start out here at the edge. Starting out here at the edge because it, there's a lot of support in the middle for this cut. Right. If I started cutting the middle out and it got too thin down there, then we'd end up with a, uh, a piece that was wanting to wobble around a lot out here and it would make it a little more difficult. Yeah, it's kind of like turning a bowl. You want to start on the outside and go in, right? Exactly. Okay. Now, the fact that that's a little bit out around is just the fact that when you're reversing a chuck, that just happens a little bit, right? It does. It does. Yeah. And I don't let that bother me because, you know, you and I are the only ones that are going to know <laughs> that that's out around. Well, maybe. Even maybe well, now they might yeah. not. Yeah. Nobody else is going to have it on the lathe is basically what I'm trying to say. Gotcha, gotcha. <laughs> oh, what happened there is I just tried to get a little too aggressive with it. I went in there with this loop open a little bit more than I should have. I probably should have closed it up a little bit and continued my cut like that. Yeah, yeah we're familiar with that. Very familiar with that. <laughs> so how thin are you wanting the rim on the uh, platter to be? We're going to go for something about 5 sixteenths out here, and I think that'll be great. And I think I'm going to come and take sort of the final cut. <laughs> well, the second to the last cut. That sounds better. Yeah, you have a theory about that, don't you? I do. I always avoid that final cut. It seems to be the one that always gets you in trouble. <laughs> now you turn the tool over to turn the cut off, basically. I did, yeah. and, and, and turning it over I stopped it from grabbing, uh -huh. and, uh, and we're in good shape there, so. Oh, it's looking ahead. beautiful there, Brian. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I'm going to just stop the lathe real quick and kind of see what we have. Looks like we got a, got a little bit of chatter out here. Nothing, yeah. nothing too serious. That'll go away with our carving process. But let's go ahead and waste this middle away and, and make a bowl shape out of the, the center of this piece. Sounds good. Now, Trent, you've been hollowing this out a bit, or dishing it out, yeah. but what's the technique for doing that? Well, I'm using the same bowl gouge that I've been using pretty much the whole time, yeah. and I'm just coming around this corner, and I'm riding the bevel of the tool. The bevel of the tool is that area that we sharpen on this particular tool, and I'm riding that bevel all the way around the inside of this gotcha. bowl and okay. trying to get as clean a cut as possible. Um, so okay. I'm just going to go ahead. I maybe have one or two more cuts in here, and yeah. we'll see how it goes.
And you're not taking off a lot on each cut. No, I, I like to sneak up on the, the shape that I'm working on, you know. <laughs> We're um, familiar with sneaking up yep, on things. Yep, yep. Yeah. So let's take a look at that and see what we got. Okay. Um, it looks pretty good, but you know, I think I can do better as far as the finish is concerned on yeah. there. There's a little bit of tear out back in here. You can see that uh -huh. and you know, that just takes more sandpaper and I hate sanding. <laughs> so, uh, so we're going to try and get rid of that with, uh, with another grind. It's a okay. similar tool, still a bowl gouge. Yeah. Um, but I've ground this particular bowl gouge, um, with this particular grind that I use for the finish cut. Okay. Um, one side is swept back and I use that on the inside of a bowl like this and yeah. the other side is, is sort of straight up and wow. I'm going to use that on the outside of the bowl. Okay. But we're not doing a bowl that I would right. use that on the outside. Um, we're doing more of a platter shape here. So I'm just going to use this to make the, to work on this little bowl part and we'll see if we can clean that up. So the angle of the grind makes more of a shearing cut? Is that how it works? It does, or? exactly. Okay. Started out with the fruit facing inside the bowl. And then once I have that bevel, that area created there, uh -huh. so I can ride that bevel on there, I can roll that tool up and then just bring the tool right down the inside of that bowl. And I'm watching the shavings that are coming off of this tool. That tells me a lot about the cut I'm getting. If I'm getting nice, long, stringy shavings, I, uh -huh. I'm pretty confident that I'm going to be getting a good cut in there too. So. Do you want to present this tool with the handle kind of level or down a little or does I, that matter? I use the, this tool with the handle pretty level. Wow. So, uh, That's beautiful. I think I'm pretty much done with the turning. That's cool. my, you know, I, I enjoy the turning, but yeah. I also enjoy the carving aspect of it too. And I think if I had to just choose one or the other, uh, I think I'd be bored. I think <laughs> I need them both. Yeah. Okay. Well, how do you go about doing your carving then? Well, I have a couple of different things. There's, there's a lot of pneumatic tools I use, but the first thing we're going to have to figure out with this piece is how we're going to hold it. And let's take it off the lathe here and just screw it off the lathe. And if we were to start our carving with this piece, um, I could have you hang on to it. Yeah. And you could be my stand while I was working and carving on it and using these sharp tools. I'm about not, the right height for you, sure, but <laughs> not not a not a real good idea. So what I've done is I've designed some different things that allow me to to carve my pieces. And this particular one is a pneumatic carving stand. That is slick which uh, kind of just fits in the banjo of my tool. Yeah. Um, of my lathe, and then I just hit this foot switch. It releases the air and allows me to move a. Uh, an axis up here, which is basically just a ball, right. allows me to move that all around and I have access to the whole piece while I'm, uh, while I'm carving on it. Just that let up the foot nippy. switch, it locks in. Same thread pattern as my lathe. Oh, you mean your chuck? Oh, the lathe and chuck. The lathe and the chuck, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Either, either way. So, so um, that's neat. Uh, there it is, and, and now we can find a good spot for it. Lock it in place and we'll grab a pencil. No, you're looking hey, for that, bro. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. This is my favorite, well, I guess my first carving tool. Yeah. And uh, I'm just going to start to use it to sort of sketch out the pattern that we're going to be doing on this particular piece. And I'm kind of, uh, you know, an artist, which means I do very little measuring. <laughs> I like it's that. at least my excuse for not measuring. Yeah that I just like things to be a little bit free form and I like to see what happens with it. And if these are, aren't all the same exact size, you know, I don't get too worried about it. And the nice thing is with the pencil, if you don't like your design, you start over. That's exactly you know, right. That's why I'm starting with the pencil because if I started with a, a, uh, a saw or whatever, the next tool is going to be a saw, mm -hmm. then I'm kind of stuck. Now, normally yeah. you wouldn't have done any sanding yet, right? No, I usually I usually go right to this, okay. and I'll sand later. Um, depending on the carving, though, sometimes I might sand before yeah. I start the carving. Um, but on this particular piece, I think we we could do the sanding after the fact. What tool do you want to start with on this? It's it's called an air body saw, yeah. and it's kind of a uh, it's on the bench over there if you want to grab it for me. Okay. It's it's a it's a saw that uses a hacksaw blade as the blade, yeah, and I kind of modify the hacksaw blade a little bit. Okay, so you trim down the top of it to make yep. it a little thinner. Yep. Okay, and this is air powered, right? It is air powered. Cool. I've drawn that pattern on there. The, the one thing I, I guess I neglected to mention was that when you come to the last few of these, 
yeah. is when you need to start thinking about their size. If you come to the last one and it ends up only being so big, it's going to look a little bit funny. Okay. So I, I kind of spread out the distance over the last mm -hmm. few and make it look how I want it to. So and again, with the pencil, if you do wind up with a funny, you just kind of shift it around do it again. Exactly. Let's plug this tool into the air. Yeah. And uh, it's going to be a little bit loud, yeah. but you know, that's half the fun. It sounds like you're doing something then. <laughs> well, I'm going to go ahead and take this cut right down there, follow my line, and then I'm going to come back on the other side and we'll okay. see how it goes. That cuts nice and smoothly. Didn't quite match up, didn't quite follow my line. I don't care, I'll make it. I'll make it work. Is that intersection important to you? It is. If I cut too far on one or the other, then it kind of starts looking messy. But so you want a nice go. clean connection right there. Yeah, exactly. Okay. That point right down in there. So I got a little work to do, so I'll get going on that. And yeah. reciprocating carver yeah. that's allowing me to uh, basically carve a little groove in there to kind of give a differentiation between these different layers. It's, mm -hmm. it's sort of a relief carving. So the tool itself, it, it, when you turn it on, it doesn't do anything, but when you press it into the wood, it starts doing something? It doesn't do anything. As yeah. soon as it, the, it gets pressed in the wood, you can see how it vibrates back and forth really quick. So. Oh, and you're holding it on the side too, right? I am holding it on the side to get it to cut at an angle like I want it to right now. It can take relatively heavy cuts. But the whole idea while you're doing it is to make it look like this is higher, this is higher here, and then it goes lower there. Exactly. Right. Exactly. That's then, pretty cool. The next step would be on that same thing. After mm -hmm. I'd done that all the way around, yeah. I would take another air tool, which is a little angle grinder. Mm -hmm. with a two inch disc on it and then I could fade that back out a little bit too. Let me show you that. And these aren't really expensive tools. You're buying these at these cheap hardware Dis places. Discount, discount okay. tool places, yeah, have okay. this kind of stuff. So now you can get a nice, yeah. nice set of carving stuff for not too much. Yeah, and one thing you had a favorite of, I remember you saying a while back, was you like to have rear port exhaustion. What does mm -hmm. that mean? Yeah, yeah. The so. rear port exhaust is where the air, excess air comes out the back of the tool. Right. And that way, if any oil or anything in the compressed air um, is there, it just shoots out the back and not on your piece. So okay. that, that helps out a whole bunch. So Now, if you don't have a reciprocating Carver, I said that well, didn't I? Uh, you can use a tool like this yeah, to do the yeah. same I thing. Could right? do, I could do a very similar thing with this with yeah. this burr too. Let me hook it into the okay. compressed air here. <laughs> that is slick. So that works that like that, yeah. and then I could again do the same sort of thing with this tool right. to clean that up. Can you use the, I mean, there are lots of different tips, right? And yep. they're carbide, yep. correct? Yep. Different shapes on okay. these particular tools. And this is a very similar tool to the last one I did. But when I'm doing more sculptural objects, this little rounded head works out really nice. And you could just do textures on pieces with this kind of stuff too. Simple stuff like that. We could push it forward like this. I wouldn't do this on this particular platter, right. but I kind of wanted to show you some different ideas. Um, there's different sizes in this same tool too. Mm -hmm. We got wow. the, the small one to, to do some more detail to stuff too. So there's, you know, the, I'm addicted to tools and uh, <laughs> I keep looking for better ones every time I'm out there shopping around. I guess the options are endless too, right? They are, that's true. Sanding, Sanding tools too, yeah. As much uh -oh. power as I can use, I'll use. Yeah. At, a, at a certain point, you know, unfortunately, you need to t take the sandpaper off the power tool 
and you need to use some elbow grease <laughs> to kind of uh, to kind of clean it up. But this oh, this uh, this is something you can do when you're just hanging out and yeah. have nothing better to do. So. Uh, you know, I would do that to, to blend out some of the surfaces in there. So. Well, I can't thank you enough, Trent, for coming on the show and helping us out on uh, learning how to do a little bit of this stuff. Well, it's been a blast, and I hope it, it inspires somebody to go ahead and start carving and, and having fun with, uh, with carving on turnings. So That's cool. Thank you. Thanks. Well, until next time on the Wood Turning Workshop, keep turning or carving. Sounds good. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Next time on the Wood Turning Workshop, we're gonna make a goblet with captive rings. So it takes all the bumping and jumping that happens sometimes when you're doing hollowing. Now we wanna start making the rings. There we go. There we go, and it's loose. <laughs> it's always easier said than done. And it's kind of a repetitive process at this point. We just work our way down until the next time on the Wood Terry Workshop. Cheers. For more information about the Wood Turning Workshop, visit our website at rsupublictv.org. Turning Workshop is made possible in part by Woodcraft since 1928 providing traditional and modern woodworking tools and supplies to generations of craftsmen Woodcraft helping you make wood work Easy Wood Tools offering a full line of wood turning tools with replaceable carbide cutters to order a DVD of this or any other episode, call 1-800-823-7210 or visit rsupublictv.org. This week on the Wood Training Workshop, we're going to show you how to make your platters pretty with the help of our guest, Trent Bosch. The wood has a lot of potential as far as the surface is concerned. Started out with the fruit facing inside the bowl. I'm using a little reciprocating carver. It's allowing me to uh, basically carve a little groove in there and you need to use some elbow grease. Definitely something to pay attention to and to be a little bit careful about. So I'm gonna... Not that we've ever done that. <laughs> <laughs>